I'd like to welcome all of you uh, to our discussion this evening. My name is David Solomon. I'm the director of the Notre Dame Center for uh, Ethics and Culture. And uh, our discussion will run for about an hour, an hour and a half. We're glad you could come out. We advertise this at quite a short notice. Um, I would like, before we, I turn the program over to uh, the Dean of the Arts and Letters College, who will moderate this discussion, I'd like to introduce the couple who are responsible for the fund that sponsored this event. There's a new fund at the University of Notre Dame called the Notre Dame uh, Fund for the Defense of Human Life, which has been funded by Bill and Peggy Dodderwike of Fort Wayne, and they're happy enough, uh, we're, we're happy they could be here tonight. Bill, could you and Peggy just stand up for a moment and we could thank you for this? <laughs> I want to wake, make one more comment before we begin. I received a number of emails from some of you who uh, disagreed with the way we described the topic for the discussion this evening. And I, I apologize if uh, that was offensive to some of you. You may have noticed we changed the description on our website, and I don't know whether you'll be happy to know or not that that was offensive to other people. It's a measure <laughs> of the depth of disagreement about the contemporary debate about abortion that even in describing what the topic is under discussion, we already run into the very deep and troubling uh, issues at, uh, at hand. Uh, but I, uh, I'm, glad, I'm glad you're all here, and I must say I'm very excited about this debate. We have been fortunate to have John McGreevy, the IA O'Shaughnessy Dean of the College of Arts and Letters, be here to moderate uh, this debate tonight. And I must say, more importantly than if anything could be more important than being Dean of the College of Arts and Letters at Notre Dame, the author of one of the most probing histories of the background for the very issue we're talking about tonight. Professor McGreevy's book, Catholicism and American Freedom, A History, tells the chronicle of how the Catholic community sort of arrived at issues like the one we're discussing tonight. And we're honored that he could uh, join us. He's the busiest man at Notre Dame to chair this debate. I will turn things over to him uh, now. And uh, you join me in welcoming Dean John McGreevy. Thank you. It's a great pleasure to be here. David is very generous uh, in describing my book. Um, I'm actually not so concerned that you read it, but I am actually quite concerned that you buy it. Uh, the, just to repeat, the title was Catholicism and American Freedom. Uh, Christmas is coming up. Uh, all of you should think about that. No, really, it is a great uh, pleasure to be here. Thank you to David for organizing this event. I'm going to make two very brief comments and then introduce our two panelists. The first, and the two comments are these. First, I will say as an historian, and that's how I begin lots of sentences because I am an historian. As an historian, it's striking that we're here in 2008, 45 years uh, uh, after Roe versus Wade, uh, and, or 35 years, and this issue is still with us. Uh, it is an intensely controversial issue that has reached into legal, ethical, medical, political, judicial, uh, and other realms of society in a way that we couldn't have imagined uh, in 1973. And that's worth remarking upon historically. Second, because it is such a controversial issue, we need to work a bit harder as a group in this room this evening than we might normally to have a productive and helpful conversation. I emphasize conversation. We have two distinguished colleagues uh, here tonight, not because they wanted to debate each other uh, uh, in the manner of uh, reality television, but because they wanted to discuss this tough, complicated issue in a sober, serious way and hopefully change a few minds, potentially, uh, but at least enlighten us uh, on the issue in a profound way. So how do we do that? How do we have a productive conversation? I think there's two crucial things. The first is that we respect all views, those that we're going to hear from our panelists, those that we're going to hear from the questioners. Uh, that means pro-life views, that means pro-choice views, and that means the views of the many people who are in some ways between, around, on top of, on some other aspect of this issue. And the second is that this is primarily a student event. 
Uh, David and his colleagues at the center have done a great work with students over the past years. And immediately after the presentations by my two colleagues from the law school, we've uh, selected a couple students to ask questions to generate the discussion. And then we'll have an open question period. Uh, but I will privilege those students here who raise their hands to ask questions because primarily we viewed this as an opportunity for a productive, helpful conversation among students. Now our panelists. On my immediate left is Professor Gerald Bradley from our law school. He is a distinguished scholar of the Constitution and teaches constitutional law uh, at Notre Dame. He is also the author of Religious Liberty in the American Republic, coming out very soon, also available as a Christmas gift, I'm sure, uh, from Heritage, Heritage Press. On my right, uh, and Jerry received his BA and JD from Cornell University. On my right is Vincent Rougeau, also a professor in our law school. He received his BA from Brown and his JD from Harvard. He is the author of a forthcoming book, is that right? You have finished your Christmas shopping already this evening. This book is entitled Christians in the American Empire from Oxford University Press. Our procedure this evening will be each Professor Rougeau and Professor Bradley will each speak for about 15 minutes. Then we'll have questions from our designated students and then we'll take questions from the floor. We will be done at 8 p.m. sharp. One risk in this event is that when people ask questions, and I should say academics are particularly prone to this problem, is that they don't ask questions, they make speeches. And so don't be surprised if when you're asking a question, I say, let's get to the question. We want to have as many questioners as we possibly can. So without any further ado, uh, I'll let Professor Bradley begin. Okay. Well, thank you, Dean McGreevy, and thank you, Professor Solomon, and all the people at the center for arranging this important event. Uh, I'm pleased to be part of it. Uh, the pro-life position uh, consists basically of these two beliefs. The first is that people begin at conception, so that killing anyone from conception onwards is killing a person. The second proposition is that it is wrong, that is to say morally wrong, to intentionally kill any innocent person. Now, neither of these beliefs, these propositions, is about religious faith. No one needs to possess religious faith to see and to say that they both are true. And you can figure out, for example, when people begin by reflecting philosophically on certain scientific facts about human reproduction and development. You can figure out that killing is wrong by reflecting upon the natural law, which, if St. Paul is to be trusted, is inscribed upon your heart. Or you can consult just about any secular or religious moral code, or just about any society's legal code, including ours. And so it won't do, I, I think, to say that abortion is regrettable or awful, or a tragedy that should be rare, or to say even that abortion is, in some sense, evil or wrong. Abortion is these things, but it is much more. It is wrongfully killing a human being who has the same right not to be killed as everybody else, including you and me. Now, moral responsibility for the injustice of abortion is not limited to those, the pregnant woman, the abortion provider, who are most immediately involved any more, just for example, than the moral responsibility for the injustice of slavery was limited to those who owned slaves. In each case, moral responsibility extends to a larger web of culpable cooperators in the injustice beyond the operating room or the plantation. In each case, unjust laws and public policies were essential to establishing a legally sanctioned sinful social structure. In each case, extending the law's protection equally to all persons would have extinguished the formal injustice in the law, which is an urgent and important end in itself, and it also would have been the necessary beginning of any serious effort to eliminate all the accompanying badges and incidents of exploitation and degradation. So just as it was wrong to support or promote public policies which made slavery possible, it is wrong to support public policies and laws which expose the unborn to destruction through abortion. Now here is where I think the 
position or positions pro-choice and pro-abortion get smudged, and the difference between them um, is transcended. And what I mean by that is, just as people who were in the old days supported another's legal right to own property in some other person, people who supported the right to own slaves, were, in my view, correctly described as pro-slavery, even though this person, these people, might own no slaves, and indeed might find the prospect of actually personally owning a slave abhorrent. Similarly now, uh, people who support the social structures which make abortion legally possible and expose the unborn to lethal violence uh, could be described as pro-abortion in a similar way to the case of slavery, even if those individuals who support those social structures never had an abortion, have no interest in having an abortion, and frankly can't imagine themselves or their loved ones having an abortion. But it's wrong to support this sinful social structure. It's wrong, in my opinion, to support any political candidate who supports or approves these sinful policies because of that position. It's wrong to support someone who is pro-choice or pro-abortion, if you will, uh, because of that position. For to do that is really to join one's own will and heart to the wrongfulness, the essential wrongfulness of abortion, which wrongfulness is not a matter of choice when the wrongfulness is focused on or expressed as or has seen as having to do with uh, unequal and unjust laws. Now, avoiding this kind of support for abortion policies and laws, what the moralists often call formal cooperation, does not exhaust one's moral responsibilities as a voter with regard to abortion. Far from it. Anyone who votes for a declared pro-choice candidate is prepared to, and if the candidate is elected, will materially cooperate in the injustice of those abortions which occur on that candidate's watch. In other words, helping to put a pro-choice candidate in office helps to make the candidate's unjust policies about abortion a legal reality. Or, as is now the case in the United States, helps to put someone in office who will do nothing to remove or ameliorate the unjust policies which are already in place. All those who vote for a pro-choice candidate, instead of a candidate who is not pro-choice, knowingly decline to do something that they could do, vote, support, to protect the unborn. They failed to do that. Now, this is a kind of material support, support in fact, material cooperation in the injustice of abortion, and it requires a commensurate or proportionate reason, sufficient reason, a reason that's good enough. Well, what would that be? How would we deliberate and decide or find out that we have a sufficient reason? Or to put it differently still, under what circumstances is it morally right to vote for someone who pledges to preserve the sinful social structure of permissive abortion? In Obama's case, Senator Obama's case, to at least expand it somewhat by adding to the present mix of unjust social structures, government funding of abortion, and also by removing some of the modest constraints presently in place in some states upon the exercise of the right to abortion, things like parental consent and the like. Well, how do we know if this is the right thing to do? Well, to answer this question, I think we have to put ourselves in the situation of those who pay the cost, who suffer the harm most pointedly, of such a regime. I think we have to apply the great moral principle we call the, moral, the golden rule. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Now, the golden rule is not a technical, specialist ordinance. It's not a somewhat helpful guideline. It is a moral principle which is essential if justice is to be done. For the golden rule makes us walk in the other's shoes, makes us count the stranger and his or her well-being 
just as much as we instinctively and with ease reckon the benefits of what we do to those dear to us and to ourselves. The golden rule pushes back against our tendency, everyone's tendency, and not just with regard to abortion. Uh, the tendency to discount the harms we visit on other people by what we do. And we discount them especially when those harms fall upon people we do not know and who cannot object and who cannot offer effective resistance. The golden rule helps us to deal with the fact that, though we may believe everyone is equal, we do not know everyone equally well. Most people we do not know at all. And with regard to most people, we have little real empathy or sympathy. The golden rule is a break upon our self-centeredness. For all of us are prone, even, to discount the harm we visit upon the well-being of even those dear to us when our own interests are implicated and we're making a decision in which our own emotions are involved. Now this question about fairness and justice, and that's what the Golden Rule is about. It's fairness and justice in side effects, in the foreseeable effects of an action we take for different reasons. So, we're supposing that one is considering voting for a pro-choice candidate, not because they're pro-choice, but for other reasons. But the candidate comes in the package, and by electing that person, one is putting into office a person who has pledged to preserve pro-choice policies or to expand them. Now this is not a specialist trick. It's everyday stuff and moral reasoning. It's in newspapers every day. Uh, not because of abortion, but because, at least as far as the newspapers are concerned, because of military operations, U.S. military operations in Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, a front page article of today's New York Times was precisely about this question of lethal side effects. It had to do with the findings of a military investigation of a, an airstrike in Afghanistan where, I guess depending upon who is to be believed, uh, either six or 30 or 90 odd Afghan civilians were killed an airstrike which targeted one or two high-level Taliban. But this is really the same thing, the same moral problem that I'm talking about with abortion and the pro-choice candidate. So let's say there is a wedding feast tonight in northwest Pakistan, and among the 100 guests present are two high-level al-Qaeda operatives. Would it be right, morally right, to launch an airstrike on the wedding feast putting everyone there at great risk of being killed. Well, for myself, I don't, I don't know for sure what the right answer to that question is, but I do know this, that any right answer has to travel through the Golden Rule so that we, by applying the Golden Rule, take full and equal account of the value of Pakistanis' lives, just as we would other people's lives. So the question, I think, about launching this airstrike, at least in large part, is uh, to beat back our temptation not to count the people in northwest Pakistan, uh, we'd have to ask ourselves, would we order the airstrike if the wedding feast with the al-Qaeda operative were in Zurich or in Dublin or, for that matter, in South Bend? If we knew the answer to that question, and if the, question, if the answer was yes, we would, I, I suppose we could and would in Pakistan. Now what I propose to do in the balance of the time available to me is simply to apply all too briefly but I still hope helpfully the golden rule to what I take to be the three best arguments, at least the ones that I've heard of, that it's fair, that it's just, it's all right to vote for a pro-choice candidate for president. Argument one, this one centers upon a claim about reducing the, the actual incidence of abortion by attacking its causes or its, its root causes. This position, as I understand it, would leave the unjust legal structure in place until at least some distant future time when the rate of abortion might be so small that abortion could be outlawed. Uh, now, in the meantime, that is to say now, there would be more money for prenatal care 
better pediatric care, more income supplements for the poor, all with a view to bringing down the number of abortions that annually are performed. Now, is this fair? Well, if you apply the golden rule, I think that does require us to consider a different example with different people involved, but an example that I think is close enough to the one posed by abortion to help us think it through. I say let's consider the example of some walking around people who would be victims of lethal actions unrestrained by law. Let's think about domestic violence. I mean, after all, it is in the family. Uh, I'm sure the causes of violence within families are multiple and varied and complex and probably will escape any final that is complete explanation. And domestic violence has proved to be highly resistant to law enforcement efforts to get rid of it. So the proposal, I'm imagining, of a candidate would be something like this. Let us stop wastefully prosecuting and imprisoning people involved in domestic violence, and to make the example work, let's say the rate of domestic violence has, is quite high. There are hundreds of thousands of women killed annually in the country by domestic violence. Now the candidate proposes to decriminalize it and to attack its root causes by offering psychological evaluations, counseling, and jobs to people who seem prone or have demonstrated a propensity to commit domestic violence. Would you support that candidate if he promised to provide this counseling? Now if not, I think you ought not to support the candidate who is pro-choice on abortion. Argument two. Some people who are tempted to or, or think they, they probably will vote for a pro-choice candidate for president, but who are pro-life, uh, don't really place much faith. Maybe they place no faith at all in the reduce the incidence root causes approach. Uh, they take the candidate in the situation with abortion for what it is, uh, but they think that the pro-choice candidate has so markedly superior positions on other issues, issues that have nothing to do with abortion, that it's just better, certainly morally justified, to vote for that candidate. Again, because of the superiority, just to name names, of Obama's positions to McCain on energy, health care, education, and the like. Well, I understand that position, but let's see if, if we apply the golden rule, uh, whether we think it's fair to act on that you know, bundle of reasons, that complex set of policies, and thinking them through to where you vote for the pro-choice candidate. So would you vote for a pro-choice candidate on the strength of his preference for, just for example, more government-provided health care than his rival's similar but less ambitious health care plan, if doing so exposed your children to mortal danger? If the candidate's commitment to a policy of choice referred not to so many tiny and invisible people, but instead referred to hundreds of thousands of immigrants, or the same number of prisoners, or mentally handicapped or physically infirm people, would you still support that candidate because of the superiority of his or her views on issues like minimum wage, income transfers, energy policy, and the environment? Now, if the answer to those questions is no, you wouldn't support the candidate if at issue were 1.2 million immigrants or prisoners, I think the answer should be no to the pro-choice candidate when the example is abortion. Okay, argument three, the last of the three arguments. Uh, this is an argument taken really from a pivotal Supreme Court case, uh, the 1992 Supreme Court case called Planned Parenthood v. Casey, a case which affirmed Roe versus Wade abortion liberty, modified it somewhat, but certainly affirmed the central liberty expressed in Roe in 1973 at a time when many people expected the Supreme Court to rule 5-4 against Roe, uh, but it didn't. Now, there's a lot of churning and academic uh, talk and legal hand-wringing in the Casey opinion, which affirms Roe, and here I'm talking about the so-called joint opinion of three Republican justices, but for my money, this, the two sentences I'm about to read, this amounts to the reason why Roe versus Wade was affirmed in 1992. And here's what the Supreme Court said, and I, I think it, uh, is it's a reason common to um, pro-choice politicians. Here it is. For two decades of economic and social developments, 
people have organized intimate relationships and made choices that define their views of themselves and their places in society in reliance on the availability of abortion in the event contraception fails. The ability of women to participate equally in the economic and social life of the nation has been facilitated by their ability to control their reproductive lives. Close quote, I add, by contraception, and abortion is backup contraception if the need arises. Now, I don't myself credit the view that abortion is necessary to women's equality, but for this discussion's purposes, I'll grant it. I'll grant the claim made. But abortion is very different from contraception, because abortion kills. Last year, 1.2 million people. Uh, and then if you think of 1.2 million people, uh, and not invisible tiny beings, but real people, uh, would we say that obtaining, acquiring, establishing the equality of a very large number of people, all women, all, pe all people in the society perhaps, but a very large number of people, would we say it is fair and just to obtain or acquire that equality at such a great cost of 1.2 million lives? I don't think we would. I don't think we would say, for example, that the equality such as it was enjoyed by the English gentry which was built on the backs of dead Irishmen, was fair or just. I don't think we'd say that the satisfactions and felicities enjoyed by Spaniards, colonists, entrepreneurs in the 16th century in the New World uh, were to be credited, celebrated by us or anyone because they were purchased and obtained by exploiting the American Indians, indigenous peoples. Nor do I think there's anything positive to be said about the equality of whites in the Old South uh, because it was purchased or was built upon the slave labor of millions of African Americans. So if the answer to the questions using different examples, Irishmen, American Indians, African Americans, is no, no, that's not fair. Even if it does, by hypothesis, uh, bring about some equality for a larger, more powerful group, I think if the answer to the question is no there, then I think the answer to the question posed or the proposition in Casey ought to be no. Thank you. Professor Rougeau. Um, thanks. Um, <clears throat> well, I, I, I want to begin by saying I have incredible respect for the work that Jerry has done uh, on behalf of the church and on the, behalf of the unborn. And we both come to this discussion, I believe, as faithful Catholics who support the teach, uh, church's teaching on abortion. And I guess where we may part is how one should live out a Catholic vocation that uh, respects the teaching in the context of one's voting obligations in a pluralist liberal democracy like the United States. But in the end, I know we both want to work toward a time when abortions don't happen. Now, I, I frame my... my um, comments a little differently. I guess I felt like I had the burden of actually demonstrating why, uh, given the fact that Senator Obama is a pro-choice candidate. Uh, I support him as Catholic, so I'm going to talk a little bit more in that vein, and actually probably give some of the reasons that Jerry identified. Um, but I think I want to, um, you know, I think in my comments I'll be able to expand a little bit more on some other aspects of how I think we might, might need to think about this issue and these questions. So, you know, although I'm a member of this advisory committee for Obama, I guess as Jerry is for McCain, I'm not speaking on the behalf of the campaign in any way. Um, but I do want to offer you my reasons for supporting Senator Obama over his opponent with particular emphasis on my assessment of this election as a Catholic. My goal here in particular is to argue that no American Catholic should feel that he or she must vote for a particular pa party. Um, because I believe that that uh, is probably not good for our democracy. Uh, unfortunately, I think that's a message that many people are receiving. So one of the questions I want to ask is, you know, it, what happens when people feel that there is only one legitimate choice uh, without violating the tenets of their faith? Obviously, the most practical way to address tonight's question is to consider the approaching presidential election and the candidates in the race. Um, 
Now, as a preface, I'd like to note that I believe that the way we frame the discussion is important, and in that regard, I don't want to accept the implication that Senator Obama, Obama is pro-abortion. I know that the argument can be made, sophisticated people make the argument, but I don't, I think it is important to consider um, some of the things that uh, have been said about the difference between being pro-abortion and pro-choice. Um, I think clearly he supports maintaining a regime, uh, a legal regime that permits abortion. But I know also that during this campaign he's committed himself to policies that I believe would lower the abortion rate. Um, most Americans, I think the most recent poll I've seen, uh, believe that abortion should be legal in some cases. Uh, when you combine the people who think it should always be legal, sometimes be legal, rarely be legal, but that still gives a legal, uh, a piece of abortion that would be legal. Uh, that's often close to 80% of the people polled. Um, and most Americans believe that, um, most Americans support Roe v. Wade, something like uh, two-thirds of people polled. So those are the facts on the ground. Those are the facts we live with. Um, and given that we live in a democracy, it's unlikely that a new legal regime can be imposed on the American people if it is one that the vast majority do not support. Now, according to his website, Senator McCain's position is that Roe v. Wade should be overturned and that the decision on abortion laws should be returned to the states. I think the practical effect of this position is not very different from Obama's. If Roe is overturned and the states decide for themselves, then abortion would probably remain legal in most states because most Americans want it to be legal. Um, so the current regime does keep it legal, and the alternatives that are presented, at least right now in the political process, will probably have the effect of keeping it legal as well. So we still are facing a situation where, you know, for the foreseeable future, abortion will be legal. Um, before I decided to s support Senator Obama, I spent a lot of time thinking carefully about three questions. First, over the last eight years, have George Bush and the Republican Party done at least a fair job of protecting and promoting the common good? Have they been good stewards of America's resources? In particular, has this party worked for peace and justice, and has it given special attention to the needs of the weakest among us, the poor, strangers, children born and unborn, the sick? Have they worked to promote the global common good? Do they recognize our nation's responsibilities to humanity around the world? My answer to these questions for the most part, not entirely, was no. And I shall offer some more explanation of why. Second, if the answer to the first question, the first inquiry is no, did I believe that Democrats under Obama McCain, I mean, excuse me, Obama Biden, would at least on balance do a better job than McCain Palin? Were they better suited to the presidency and the vice presidency? Would they provide better leadership to the nation as a whole? To this I answered yes. Sorry. Third, in light of my judgment that overall the Democrats would do a better job of promoting and protecting the common good than the Republicans, does Senator Obama's support for maintaining the current legal regime permitting abortions vitiate that and make it impossible for me as a Catholic to vote for him? And here I decided the answer was no. So let's go to the first question, evaluating the performance of the current Republican administration. I believe that we have probably endured a particularly bad administration over the last uh, eight years, particularly in the last four years. After reflecting on the Republican Party's performance in government in light of Catholic social thought, I've come to disagree with significant major positions the party has advanced during the Bush presidency. Under Republican leadership, I believe the common good has been grievously harmed, not only domestically, but worldwide. Just to mention a few examples, foreign policy. Our country was led into a disastrous war of choice that will probably go on for years. The war was vigorously opposed by the church. To make matters worse, the Bush administration fashioned a doctrine of preventive war, which is also immoral from a Catholic perspective, that could create global instability for decades to come. The loss of innocent life as a result has always been, already been enormous, but it pales in comparison to what might happen in the future if new conflicts are pursued for preventive reasons. Our current government has isolated us from the world community 
pressed policies that would expand the use of torture, remember the, the torture memos, and the sought to discharge, uh, to discourage, excuse me, the, exam, the in expansion of key human rights. All of this, I believe, is in opposition to the church's teaching. Economic policy. For almost 30 years, the Republican Party has led the charge on an economic policy of vigorous deregulation, low taxation, and aggressive free markets. We are now watching this, what the French call savage capitalism, fall apart, and our economy slip rapidly toward the abyss of depression. Under Republican leadership, we have seen the desires of the rich become the focus of economic policy over the needs of the poor. We have hundreds of billions of dollars available for Wall Street bailouts and wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. Meanwhile, our nation's infrastructure has been left to crumble. The public education system is inadequate. Income equality has soared, inequality has soared, and social mobility has declined. Where, might you ask, does the Republican Party stand on questions of economic justice? Not, it seems, with the church, and typically not with the poor or the working and middle classes. Immigration. This issue, in my opinion, represents a particularly low moment for the Republican Party from a Catholic perspective. Some of the weakest members of our community, poor migrants and immigrants, were subjected to one of the most hateful anti-immigrant campaigns in recent memory, led for the most part by the House of Republicans. Their political proposals and their rhetoric were vigorously denounced by the church, as well as by normally sympathetic media like The Economist and The Wall Street Journal. On this issue, on this issue President Bush deserves some credit for reminding his party that migrants are human beings, but that message did not sit well with many Republicans in Congress. Due in large part to the vitriol, xenophobia, and nativist hate that developed around this issue, our immigration system remains a disaster and a source of much injustice. We do, however, have the beginnings of a fence along the Mexican border that could ultimately consume billions of dollars and probably won't stop migrants. Perhaps the declining economy will no doubt be much more effective in doing that. <laughs> Fourth, Republican hostility to the government as a promoter of the common good. The Republican Party has typically opposed attempts to use the government to assist the weak, but Republicans are generally quite willing to seek government assistance for large industries when the market fails. Consider just a few examples from the last 20 years. Savings and loan crisis, airlines, the auto industry, and now Wall Street. I mean, this is a, a pattern of stepping in and assisting corporate or corporations or the corporate sector. The party has been hostile to the idea of using government to expand health care, coverage to the uninsured, seeking instead a market-based solution, despite the fact that this approach has not worked. As a general rule, the Republican Party has opposed attempts to vindicate the social and economic rights of the poor through government action and has resisted the general provision of many things, like health care, that Catholic social teaching has consistently said must be made available to all so that they may lead a genuinely human life. Now, I should say right here that there are obviously different ways of approaching this, but I'm thinking generally about the philosophy of the party and how it's typically played out in our political debates. The party resists environmental protection schemes and encourages our wasteful use of natural resources. Consider the resistance to the increase in gas, gas mileage standards for autos and drill, baby, drill. Um, this administration has encouraged our materialism and consumerism and has discouraged any conversation amongst us about sacrifice and sharing, even for the war it was so anxious to start. The party is heavily libertarian, pro-business, and anti-government, in contrast to our faith, which is communal and pro-poor, and sees the state as having an important role to play in our common life. So on to the second question. Would the Democrats do a better job? The Democrats get many things wrong, and they are subject to some of the same libertarian and individualist influences as the Republicans, which are deeply ingrained in American culture. Nevertheless, on most of the issues I've just mentioned, I find the Democratic position much more consistent with my understanding of Catholic social teaching and much more attentive to the overall common good. As a general rule, I believe the Democrats are more aware of our nation's responsibilities to the global community. They pursue economic policies that are fair to the poor, working and middle classes. They have, on the whole, more humane views on immigration, and they are more willing to direct public money and government support to those most in need. As a party, the Democrats also look a lot more like the country we live in, and if the participants in conventions are any guide, the party encompasses a much broader range of ethnic, social, and income groups. 
So then on to the third question. Despite all that I've just described, does the pro-choice position of Senator Obama, Obama vitiate all the positive ways I believe the Democrats would enhance the common good? Does it make irrelevant all of the Republican failures I have identified? I've been teaching and writing about Catholic social thought for over a decade, and I have a book with Oxford Press that will soon be released on the subject. I've read all the social encyclicals closely, and I've studied the theological commentary extensively. Catholic social thought is a body of interrelated teachings focused in particular on the human person as a social being created in the image and likeness of God. The right to life is a teaching that draws content and meaning from concepts like solidarity and participation, particularly for the poor and the weak. Abortion is an extremely important life issue, and we must never support the intentional taking of innocent human life. Our legal system is flawed in this regard. But all life issues are linked to the need to work toward the basic goods that all human beings require to live and thrive. To ignore or minimize them is inconsistent with what Catholic social teaching, challenge, teaching challenges us to do. Catholics are called to assess their political choices in light of the totality of the circumstances in which they live, to inform their consciences, and to exercise prudence when making political judgments. Although I believe the law should make clear that abortion is wrong, I also recognize that the legal system in a pluralist democracy will not always reflect my values. There has never been a time when we have not had to live with deep inconsistencies between demands of our faith and our life in the world. I think that I can demonstrate my commitment to the Catholic teaching on abortion in a number of ways. I do not believe that I have to vote for candidates whose policies I do not support simply because, a candidate whose policies I do not support, simply because he shares my belief that abortion is wrong. Political responsibility is much broader than that. The life issues are broader than that. For example, Many Republicans vigorously support the death penalty. Not only is this killing permitted by the state, it's performed by the state. And there are no circumstances present in the United States today that justify it from a Catholic perspective. Why isn't this Republican failure in terms of Catholic teaching worthy of the same scrutiny given to the Democrats on abortion? I happen to know, because I've spoken to him, that Senator Obama firmly believes that abortion is a morally serious issue and that it should be a goal of our public policy to decrease its occurrence. That may not be enough for everyone. I think he is sincere in his desire to move the Democratic Party away from the aggressive promotion of abortion rights that we have seen in the past. Thankfully, the number of abortions performed in this country has been on the decline now for close to 20 years. The important legal work of many pro-life groups has no doubt played an important part in this decline, but there is also compelling evidence that increases in social welfare spending lead to declines in abortion. The declines were much sharper, actually, during the Clinton administration than during the last eight years. And evidence from peer nations supports the relationship between low abortion rates and high social welfare spending. It's clear to me that the Democrats are much more committed to the spending than the Republicans are. The people who are most likely to seek abortions, African American and Hispanic women, are the people most likely to benefit from the increased social spending program, uh, social spending, uh, and spending on public goods. These are also two of the groups in American society who have suffered the most consistent social, economic, and political marginalization, which may also help explain why these women resort disproportionately to the tragic choice of abortion. So, to conclude, I believe there are overwhelming and compelling reasons, consistent with Catholic social teaching and a well-informed Catholic conscience, to support Senator Obama in this election. And I think this is a decision that individuals have to make doing just what I've described. So I hope just from that general overview, we at least have a platform from which to think a little bit more, given what Professor Bradley has said and what I've tried to offer about weighing these choices. My judgment is that the, ish the conditions of proportionality can be met and are met, at least for me. Thank you. A round of applause for both Professor Bradley. Thank you. We'll begin with our designated student questions. If I could have one question from this side. If you could identify yourself and maybe say what year you are. Can you hear me? Okay. <laughs> um, my name is Mary Daly. I'm a junior here at the university. Um, and for what it's worth, I'm also the president of Notre Dame Right to Life. So um, 
that's where I'm coming from. <laughs> um, my question is kind of addressed to uh, both speakers, uh, which thank you very much for your very well thought out comments. I appreciate them very much. Um, over the summer, I read an article by Doug Kmick, who was, has in the past been affiliated with the university. I'm sure that both of you are, or a lot of people here might be familiar with um, his sort of what's going on. Um, the article particularly that I read was in which he was um, reaffirming and defending his endorsement of Obama for many of the reasons that Professor uh, Rugo has, I'm sorry if I just put your name, oh. <laughs> um, for funny. many of the reasons <laughs> that he just um, gave to us, uh, namely that Obama presents a plan of social and economic development that could in such a way um, it, in some point in time, abortion would become obsolete, essentially. Um, but for me, it kind of looks illogical that that would be possible because for a candidate who is as pro-abortion as Obama has shown himself to be in uh, repeatedly voting against the Infants Born Alive Act, um, not supporting the Hyde Amendment, and has also voiced strong support for the Freedom of Choice Act, um, there's a certain discrepancy between um, his voting record and then this particular plan, or the, the possibility of what his, or the potentiality of what his plans could um, give to the American public. So I was wondering if both of you could comment on that. Like, it does look, it looks illogical to me, um, and if you could maybe explain that more, maybe s just, yeah. Can <laughs> we start with Jerry? Well, it's, an, it's, a, it's a large and ambitious question. Let me take a, a crack at perhaps the last part of it, about the hope or expectation that abortion could become obsolete or, or rare. Um, I, I think that's a naive position. Uh, I think the elephant in the room that hasn't been discussed, uh, not only tonight, but by the candidates very much, and certainly not by Senator Obama, is the proximate cause of abortion, uh, which is that too many people are having sex who have no interest in kids. Uh, and that's not a function, I think, of being poor or downtrodden or misunderstood or anything else that could be resolved or even ameliorated by income transfers. Now, that has to do with a degraded moral culture for which neither the Democrats nor Republicans are especially or at least solely responsible. Uh, it's probably my generation of people who went to the college in the 60s who started the whole thing, early 70s in my case. But there it is. So I think that the beginnings of any effort to get at the root causes of abortion would have to not only include but prominently feature some set of effective public policies by which we got a law to prompt culture so that culture communicated to people much better than it does now that sex and kids and marriage kind of go together as a bundle. Uh, and that would do more, in my opinion, than any other particular policy to reduce the number of abortions in a country. Uh, and the second thing I'd say about the possibility of making abortion almost obsolete, I think it's naive for a different reason. And it's because, um, unlike drug use or sexual acting out, which really are kind of escapes or forms of acting out, and they kind of enter or cause you to enter kind of unreality, the fact is abortion actually solves problems. Uh, it's not self-destructive behavior that mature people see as a waste of time. Uh, so abortion, like many other kinds of, of evils, will always be alluring and tempting. Uh, even when people only have sex when they want kids, and let's say when they're married, may change their minds during pregnancy about what their plans are. Or they may discover during pregnancy they have a Down's child or something else. So I don't think that um, an evil which is alluring and which solves genuine problems could ever be thought to be obsolete. It'll always be tempting. And I think the beginning of any effort to cause that to be the kind of temptation, which is off the table just as killing infants is off the table. That's just not something that's done. I think besides repairing the family, um, the law, the great teacher, has to teach that it is wrong. And unless the law teaches that abortion is wrong, I do think it's naive to think it will go away. I'll just briefly, I mean, on, on the legislative votes, I mean, I'd be the first to admit that there's, there have been votes that 
the Senator Obama, uh, excuse me, Senator Obama took prior that do seem somewhat inconsistent with what his position seems to be now. But I would also add that, you know, the legislative process and why people vote for things and, and you know, what goes on in, um, in legislatures isn't always uh, clear. And other, there's a lot of strategic voting. There are people vote for things for all kinds of reasons. Uh, and so, I mean, I'm not, I'm not trying to justify that in particular, but I do think that we have to be careful in trying to draw any firm conclusions on people's beliefs uh, based purely on how they vote. I mean, just to give an example, you know, tons of people voted against civil rights legislation, have voted against it continuously. I don't think they were all racists or all anti-women or anti-whatever group was involved in that legislation. They may have had procedural concerns or other concerns. Some of them probably were anti-women and racist, but, um, you know, I just think we have to be, be careful in that regard. Um, just to get to Jerry's point about, you know, allowing abortion to die out, you know, I can't say for sure that it would work, but I, I do think there are examples, and I think you know, Jerry raised slavery, and I think that was a good one to raise. You know, the United States was the only slave culture in the Western Hemisphere that had to have a brutal war to end slavery. Uh, and then after the slavery was ended, you know, the, the descendants of the slaves were basically still pretty much non-persons in many ways in the places where most of them lived in the South. Um, and uh, the law imposed on the southern states didn't matter because the southern states weren't ready to accept it. They were in no way going to recognize the, the civil rights of freed slaves. Other cultures didn't happen that way. You know, Brazil, so slavery, which is a very similar case to the United States in terms of the makeup of the society and the way slavery was used, slavery died out or, you know, it was kind of eradicated in various uh, cultural and social ways. And then it was outlawed. Um, and actually the lot of the freed Brazilian slaves was substantially better in, in the 19th century and early 20th century than the lot of freed American slaves. So, you know, different societies have different ways of solving their problems. Law sometimes precedes uh, cultural change and it doesn't, it sometimes comes after it. But I think the possibility for it working both ways is there and there are examples from history that demonstrate that. Identify yourself. Sure. Good evening. Uh, my name is Nick Guzman. I'm a third year law student at the law school. Um, my question is for Professor Bradley. Actually, it's more of a follow up to one of the points you made. At the end, when you talked about the arguments that people tend to make, you said um, you analogized that. I'm, I'm not quite sure whether you said um, you talked about spousal abuse. You talked about whether if that was, did you say that that would have been legal in your scenario or if it was illegal and we would we'd be willing to stop it? Um, I used the example of domestic abuse as a, a parallel case with a different class of victims, uh, but otherwise the same proposal to attack the root causes while decriminalizing a particular kind of misbehavior. So my, my suggestion was if you'd vote for someone who said, let's have no criminal or legal sanction for even killing your spouse, because that doesn't seem to work very well anyway, and you have to educate people first, that candidate says, let's educate, let's counsel, let's provide jobs for angry men. Uh, and leave the thing to die out a kind of natural death. Would you vote for that person? Now, I, I know I would not, and I suspect most people wouldn't, and I'm suggesting the golden rule tells us that uh, we shouldn't support the abortion pro-choice candidate. The reason I ask is because I was going to come at you with that first point that you made, that, you know, it's about, it's about from, and from my perspective, it would be more important to stop the number of abortions, whether it's legal or illegal. I think that that parallel you draw is respectfully a little inconsistent in the sense that maybe if um, if spousal abuse was legal and then we were looking to see I mean then you can draw I think a parallel but I think it's troubling and so I wonder what aside from that analogy what is your response to the, the idea that it would be more important for some people to save more lives and ensure that less abortions happen on a yearly basis I mean you can draw parallels and I think Professor Rougeau stated it to our peers across the world I mean there are countries in Scandinavia that perform very few abortions every year and there's countries in Latin America where it's completely illegal and the abortion rate is extremely high so outside of that analogy how would you respond to something to that? Well I think the central point about um, you know trying to reduce lives uh, reduce deaths cost in lives is when I take over I embrace it I mean why shouldn't we do both that is to say, why shouldn't it be the case that uh, a decent society attacks what it perceives to be the causes or at least conditions in which abortion 
temptation festers. At the same time, it serves the good of justice to say killing is wrong and it's against the law. So it's not an either or thing. And it's not an either or thing, not only practically because you can pursue two, three, four, or five different policies, prohibit something, and then attack the causes. But also, I think that it, the way you express it, for example, tends to um, obscure the, the deep and intimate connection between what the law is and whether the law says this killing or that killing or this violence or that violence is wrong, it's unjust, people who engage in it are punished, and the incidence of that kind of behavior. And I don't think, you know, examples of cases from Latin America with abortion or in our own country with prohibition, I, I don't think the fact, and it's certainly a fact or a truth about social affairs, that you can have wholly ineffective attempts to prohibit some conduct which is embedded in the culture and which just proves to be resistant to legal control. To some extent, to some extent, we're thinking, or we think we may be discovering that with some forms of drug usage. Um, that's a fact, but I don't think very much follows from that. It may be, in the case of prohibition, where the harm, the, the conduct, drinking, is more or less a self-regarding evil. You know, self it involves only harm to the person who drinks. Uh, you may attain repeal of prohibition, uh, but I don't think the lesson of cases like prohibition extends so far as to say when it comes to lethal violence, drop the legal part of the solution and pursue the root causes. And, and I, I do think I think that applying the golden rule, whether it's domestic violence as a parallel example or something else, I think that's a necessary part of figuring out whether abortion restrictive policies are like prohibition and somehow it would be right to drop the legal sanction and pursue a sim simply a cultural solution. Well, you know, for argument's sake, maybe, but I think you have to apply the golden rule before you say maybe and indeed yes. Hi, I'm uh, Steve Wallace. I'm a third-year law student, um, and thank you again for uh, being here for this event. Um, my question is for Professor Rougeau. Um, I found the, uh, the structure of your argument, again, respectfully, uh, to be unsound. And because the church presents with the fact that abortion is an intrinsic evil, John Paul II, and you probably could quote the encyclical, better than me, uh, said that this, no society is just without protecting the lives of the unborn in the law. Um, and in approaching this question, we've said that the church says that you can't, you can't vote for a pro-abortion candidate without a proportionate reason. Uh, your analysis seemed to proceed from the other end, where you listed the proportionate reasons and then used a totality of the circumstances test to see whether abortion overcame those reasons. Uh, and that seems to me to fundamentally uh, disregard or value inappropriately what abortion is and the evil that it is. So if you could please address why you structured your argument that way and whether it uh, addresses how evil abortion actually is. Well, I mean, I tried to preface my comments with saying basically that I agreed with the the church's position on abortion and with what Professor Bradley said about the actual, you know, the teaching of the church, that abortion is wrong. So I think what I was trying to do was to say, but we're faced in this particular election with a situation where we have, we live in a society that has, um, I guess, a democratic consensus, for better or worse, um, around a law that permits abortion. Um, and so there's not a lot I can do at, you know, first instance to deal with that. But before getting to that, I wanted to just, to just you know, so accepting the fact that abortion is wrong, I wanted to present a range of other issues that I, as a citizen and a voter, have to consider when, when voting. And knowing that my vote alone will not change the circumstances, um, I think that that's sort of what I was trying to do in terms of showing, well, there are all these other things that need to be dealt with, all these other harms that are affecting the common good, 
all these other policies that I believe are wrong or immoral or whatever, and none of them will be addressed um, in my mind. And again, this is a choice that an individual has to make. You know, you're, you're supposed to, you know, we each have freedom of conscience recognized by the church to make, to do this weighing. And the prohibition, of course, is to participate directly in an abortion. But beyond that, you know, we have to deal with the circumstances in which we find ourselves in the various societies in which we live, and those circumstances vary widely. So I think it's very difficult to say that, you know, just one, um, yeah, well, I'll stop on that, so. Hi, um, my name is Colin Masters. I guess, unsurprisingly, at this point, I'm also a third-year law student. Um, <laughs> my professor, or my professor, my question is for either professor. Um, <clears throat> I guess, um, you know, my sense of the issue, I, I, I think I come from this in the same perspective where I, I think abortion is obviously a terrible, awful thing and it's wrong. Um, but assuming at the end of the day on November 5th we wake up and we have President Barack Obama um, and we do recognize that President Obama would create all of the social goods that I think Professor Rougeau very eloquently laid out, um, a, a better, perhaps more... Uh, in, in line with Catholic social teaching perspective on uh, immigration, the dignity of uh, human life in that perspective, the poor um, and proactive war and those kind of those kind of things that I think really resonated with me from, from your talk, Professor Rougeau. Um, do we risk becoming too, I guess, I don't want to say myopic because it's a very important issue, but too obsessed with the issue when at the end of the day, um, what will end up happening is that the choice will go from uh, a choice of the coercive arm of the state to a choice of an individual and their relationship with their community and uh, their God. And uh, I think that those are very powerful forces as well. And if we view um, if we view all the social goods that, that I think that you laid out very well. Um, that maybe, I mean, it's obviously always going to be a problem because abortion is such a terrible thing to come up with a commensurate reason because nothing is going to seem good. But at the end of the day, um, I guess, what role does private, I guess you could even think of it as a privatization of abortion regulation, if it makes you feel better about it. And we need, um, we need a question. Sorry. Uh, like, how, how much does uh, the personal private um, relationship help to sort of soften the blow of uh, being in a society that doesn't necessarily condemn abortion? Well, uh, I'm not sure if I really have gotten your question um, clear in my mind, but I, I think I have at least part of it in, in my mind clearly. And I think you're describing the world in which we, we do live, right? Um, where abortion is unrestricted as a practical matter, a legal matter at least, and there are a large number of abortions, and as the law said as far back as Roe versus Wade, there are all these factors which the woman and her physician will take into consideration, and I, I, it's perfectly fine with me if we drop into an examining conscience with the help of people whose judgment she trusts on such important moral questions. So I think the world you described is the world we have. So that's why I'm not exactly sure, you know, the question is about Barack Obama on November 5th is the president, what will we do then? I, I, I don't know other than that we'll do whatever it is we're doing now. And the one other thing I would say in response to the question, it, it, it tried to show in, in part, though I didn't emphasize it perhaps enough, in any event it, it should be said more clearly perhaps, that you know, abortion is never a private matter any more than slavery was ever a private matter. Abortion, as we're talking about tonight, is not something that people sometimes do. Uh, it's that, uh, but it's something much bigger and quite public, uh, and that is that the law protects, furthers that choice where it funds it, uh, and protects it in many ways, but especially by preventing anyone, including the father of the child or a relative or anybody else, from trying to do what they could do and may feel even morally obliged to do to save that child. So the law is integral to let's call it privatizing abortion. So I guess that's a long, longish way of saying 
I don't think there's any solace in thinking that abortion would be truly private. Uh, no, it's not going to be any more private than it is now. No, all I've done is I guess you know what we face is really trying to deal with. Um, I mean, we're living in this very morally flawed, complex world. I mean, we are never going to be in a position. Well, one of the, the comments I tried to make is we have always had a circumstance in our societies where something bad was going on, something either the law may have supported or maybe there was no law to, to deal with it, but there were there are always these conditions in, in the lives of our communities that cry out for justice. So, I mean, if we just our own history, you know, slavery, segregation, you know, all kinds of discrimination, these things have always been present. So, you know, I don't, without becoming sort of, Without despairing, I guess we have to still have some way of, you know, attacking those things and also finding other ways and other things that we can, you know, address that we hope will move us forward, you know, recognizing that we will never find perfection. Floor is open. Why don't you say your name and identify yourself? another third year law student. <laughs> I am, yeah. Um, I'm Anna Franzanello, and I'm also a third year law student. Um, and my question is for Professor Rougeau. I, I found it interesting um, that you kept comparing Senator Obama to President Bush, because um, he's obviously running against Senator McCain. Um, but that also prompts my question, too, so it's kind of helpful that you did that. Um, you talked about how uh, Senator Obama is kind of for keeping the status quo on abortion um, versus kind of, you know, uh, looking at um, in, uh, uh, having more pro-life legislation, whatever. But um, from what I understand um, from what he's promised and um, even even not considering Supreme Court justices or FOCA, if that passes, um, two things immediately that he can do, and I think from what I understand he will do um, if he becomes president, kind of undermine your proportionality reasons. Number one um, being the Mexico City policy, um, where, again, our taxpayer dollars are going to start going to abortion. So if we're paying for that, then we're not going to be able to fund some of the, the good programs that you see him being able to do unless we raise taxes even higher to cover abortion and these programs. And in a time of economic crisis, which I think you know also can be attributed to Democrats as well, that might not be a good policy. Um, and then the second thing that that he's going to do very differently from the Bush administration. I think you're probably aware of um, ACOG, the American uh, College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists. Um, recently, the Bush administration has come to the defense of pro-life um, OBGYNs, who APLOG has um, over 2,500 members. Um, who their, their consciences have been protected. They haven't been forced to choose between them. Here, too, we need a question. Okay. Um, anyway, but that, that's another thing that Obama is going to, his administration is going to be doing very differently, which in a time of health care crisis is going to cripple us even more. Um, so my question for you is, am, am I misunderstanding that? Is he, are, are my taxpayer dollars not going to be going towards abortion? And is he also going to be protecting health care um, consciences? I'll try to just answer quickly so we can get, because I can only be here for 20 more minutes. Um, you know, I don't know what he's going to do. You know, I, I, I have to make a judgment about who I think overall will be a better leader. He may do some things that I find abhorrent, you know, mm -hmm. but typically most presidents have done things that I find abhorrent. Um, I use the Bush administration because that's my only reference point for how a Republican administration, since it's been, the Republicans have been in power for eight years, I think it gives us a pretty good idea. And I try to use different, you know, aspects of it. The administration, the Congress, those are, that's, the president doesn't work in isolation. He works with, you know, his uh, with his administration and with the Congress of his party. So that was my reason for doing that. I mean, and I didn't really, I was trying to make some general comments about how typically, I'm not saying in all cases, how typically we in this country perceive, you know, the ways the party um, operate. But that was my personal opinion. And I, I guess what I'm trying to argue as well is, like any citizen, I have certain issues that I find particularly important, and I have a certain vision of how one party or the other works. So no one has to embrace guess, that vision. But would you, I mean, if you had to take a guess, would you, would you tell me that he's not going to reverse the Mexico City policy and that he's, he's going to protect um, 
the consciences of healthcare providers. You know, I'm not. I'm in a, I don't want to get into a political debate about what he will do. I okay. do not know, okay. and I'm not going to guess. And I'm going to tell you that if he does something that I don't like, th I'm, that doesn't necessarily change, you know, the analysis. It might mean that you know he could disappoint me, and I could say, well, that was a bad choice to make. But isn't that part of voting in a democracy? Don't we have the ability to choose and to recognize that sometimes those choices don't come out the way we hope? We don't know for sure. And so, I, you know, if I had voted Republican, which I did once, and I found myself... <laughs> what happened? <laughs> well, the last eight years happened. That's exactly what I'm trying to say. I mean, I, was, I personally was very, very disappointed and deeply disturbed by what happened over the last eight years. So that was my judgment, but it doesn't have to be yours. Thank you. Next question. Uh, my question is Professor Rougeau. Um, I wrote it down, so I won't forget it. Mm -hmm. um, you brought up the point that there are reasons for voting against um, an issue, which I completely support and understand. Um, however, Obama said that uh, this is a moral issue, abortion. However, he said that the first thing he would vote for is the Freedom of Choice Act. And a clause under this act states that everyone must provide abortions, uh, like all hospitals. Um, Assuming that Catholic hospitals, if they had governmental support, which they would because they provide um, care for welfare patients, would also have to provide this. Um, this would stop hospitals from practicing Catholic social teachings and helping others. And so not only would this allow abortion to, for allow abortion to happen, um, but also support, make Catholic, sorry, excuse me, before it's support upon the church. How do you look past that? Well, I, I've heard this quote. I have not been able to confirm it. I don't know what the, the source is. I only see it as something that comes from, uh, you know, certain sources, and I haven't – I've tr actually tried to confirm when it was said, where it was said, and why it was said. But on FOCA, you know, that's, that's a, a piece of legislation that I wouldn't necessarily agree with. I don't even know if that's constitutional. I don't even know if it would ever even make it to the president's uh, desk, you know, to be signed. So, um, you know – it's, again, it's a similar question. I mean, I don't know what that legislation will do. It's been sitting around really for almost uh, since the, like 1989 or 1990, and it's never really advanced. So it's still really a theoretical question. So, but I'm totally willing to admit that aspects of that legislation I find um, that I would disagree with. Uh, but I can't say exactly if, I mean, if it were to pass in the way that you described, that would be a real problem. But since I don't know if that's going to happen, uh, I, you know, I can't really opine beyond that. Upstairs. Okay. Hi, I'm Kelly Levis. I'm a junior. Um, Professor Bradley, you mentioned the proximate cause of abortion as too many people having sex and not enough people being interested in having children. Um, and, uh, Rajo, you mentioned sacrifice as being something missing in the Republican Party. Um, I was wondering you know, if you'd both like to answer, but what you think that your candidate, how they'll address that proximate cause, whether that's through abstinence programs, you know, education vouchers, taxes, but, um, you know, if, if that is indeed the root behind so many abortions, how, how will they address that? Well, I'm sure there's a lot to be said, Kelly, in response to your question, and I don't, I don't have at hand, nor will Dean McGreevy give me the time to describe a comprehensive family-friendly policy. But I, I do think that, you know, the issue that's right in the forefront on this is, is the definition, legal definition of marriage. So I do think that with regard to the question of restoring, or for the law to do what it can to restore a decent culture of sexual restraint, procreation and marriage, uh, that project does start and depends to a great extent upon preserving marriage as a union of man and a woman. And on this issue, I think there is a difference between the candidates, uh, not only in their announced policies or positions on the question of same-sex marriage and civil unions, but I think the real action there is on judicial appointments. Um, I, I don't think it's being adventurous to suggest that uh, McCain is, is much more likely to nominate judges for the appellate bench, including the Supreme Court, uh, who would look askance at an asserted constitutional right to same-sex marriage, at least when compared to people who are liable to be nominated by a President Obama. 
I'll just throw something quickly in. I mean, I think this whole issue of culture is really important. I actually agree with Jerry. I think there's a lot that needs to be done to change the culture in which we live. Now, how we do that as, as, as people of faith, it, one of the important ways of doing that is through witness. I mean, we witness in our own lives and how we, how we live. We don't necessarily depend on um, the structures, the legal structures in which we live. To, to, those are a great way of doing that and an important way and a significant way. I don't want to minimize that. But, um, you know, one of the great traditions of, of Christianity is obviously Christians going out into the world, living in cultures that are completely different, that don't necessarily share our values, and living in witness to those values and changing those cultures. So um, sometimes, and I think in a sense, we may actually kind of be living in a culture that, I mean, isn't necessarily rooted anymore uh, to the degree we might hope or like in the kind of... Uh, religious values it, it maybe once was. And, and you don't think that uh, Senator Obama will have any policies that will um, address sort of these issues? Oh, I mean, I do, I do think he will. I mean, I think I tried okay. to speak to that in my, my, my um, t talk, my, my remarks. Um, I mean, I think there's a lot he wants to do uh, and a lot that he suggested that would be designed to, um, you know, give people the resources, the health care, all kinds of things that they need to live out the kind of life that would allow them to raise their children, that would give them the kinds of um, support that they would need to, to, to make better choices. Uh, you know, I just, I don't want to minimize, and, and I don't want to take too much time, but, you know, the, the despair in some of the communities uh, in this country is real. And I, I, I can't emphasize enough, you know, the situation that you might find in some of the minority communities in the inner city, for instance, where you have women who know that the culture holds them in disdain and holds their children in disdain. Um, you know, these women are faced with bearing children in a society where they know that for the most part, if they have sons, they will go to jail or they will get involved in all kinds of antisocial behavior, not because they're not good people, but because the environments in which they live make it very difficult to avoid that. You know, and when they have children out of wedlock, they are you know, disparaged and blamed for all kinds of social problems. Giving those people some kind of foothold in the society where they are respected and honored as human beings in ways they have not heretofore been, are the, those are the kinds of things I think Senator Obama wants to do. Thank you very much. Uh, up, up on the top, uh, the red, red t-shirt. Hi. My name is Cornelius Griggs, and uh, I'm a physics student. I uh, wish to ask a question. Is it not fair to, uh, or not unfair to compare the platform of Republicans and Democrats and then make a voting decision, particularly when one candidate is clearly kind of at least established himself as a, a rebel against the party and these kind of things? And for instance, I mean, on the specific issue of torture, like, if there's ever been a candidate clearly against torture, I would think that was the Republican, even though that was attributed to part of the uh, Republican Party. Right? This seems here too. We're going to need a qu oh, quick question. Yeah, so, is this uh, how can we justify comparing the two candidates' political parties rather than the two candidates' actual positions? Well, as I said, I don't think a candidate exists in isolation. I think a candidate exists in the context of his party, and he has to get. Uh, you know, advisors and everyone from the, the party elects or does the work of electing a president and keeping that president in power. But again, that was, my judgment you may be flawed in your mind, and that's okay. I mean, but I think that, that's just the judgment I make. But you can make a different judgment. Uh, just quickly, I, I, McCain is supposed to torture. He knows something about the subject. Um, and I think that that's a good example of a kind of moral courage that um, any society which aspires to be decent really needs at the helm because it, it's really a position that says it's just wrong to torture and we don't do it. That's not to say, as all too many of us attempted to say, we don't torture unless we have to, or we only torture people when they're not quite like us or when they're really, really bad. Um, no, we don't do it because it's wrong, and we don't do it even if it causes difficulty or even harm to us to refrain from doing what's wrong. And I think that, even in a society which is pluralistic in some ways and is debilitated by certain kinds of social pathologies and other troubles, um, every society needs that kind of moral decency and courage at the top spot. Thank you. 
Hi, my name is Kate Schenke. I'm a political science graduate student. And my question is for Professor Bradley. Um, if I understand your argument correctly, you're saying that if I'm a pro-life voter, I should put, in a sense, all my eggs in one basket, that really overturning Roe v. Wade is very, very crucial. But as Professor Ruggio alluded to, if Roe v. were overturned, um, a very, I think a most recent article I read said something like 10% of abortions in the United States would actually become illegal because a very small number of states would actually um, pass laws to make abortion illegal. So my question is, as a pro-life voter, why should I put all my eggs in that basket in the sense of saying Roe v. overturning Roe v. Wade has to be um, my ultimate goal and the only thing that I focus on? I didn't say any of those things, so I'm not sure how to respond to it. So, so I'm not right. You don't think that in this election that pro-life voters should vote for John McCain, I'm assuming, because he would overturn Roe v. Wade? I, that's not what you're saying? Well, I do think people should vote for McCain, but I didn't say anything about putting all your eggs in a basket. I didn't say you should vote only to overturn Roe v. Wade. And I didn't say most of the rest of what you said I said, so I'm not really sure where the response can go. Okay, well then, do you agree that we're faced with a choice in this election, in the sense that if I vote for John McCain, I went on his website before I came here tonight to see what he said otherwise in terms of abortion, and he had a statement about civil society needs to help women who are faced in difficult choices. Whereas I see Professor Ruggio's explanation of um, Senator Obama's positions, that he would do more to say, this is how I'm going to help. Here's my plan for how I'm going to help these women that are in these difficult situations. So I guess, I, I guess I'm wondering if you think it is at least a difficult choice and not a slam dunk for pro-life voters. Well, I would say this. I think that you should put lots of issues in your basket, but the one I haven't heard you mention yet is the one that I think needs to be added to your card, and it is embryo-destructive research, where there are millions and millions of lives on the table. And the next administration is going to make decisive moves to institutionalize the gross and mass exploitation of tiny people, experiment on them, break them up, and kill them so that some of the rest of us can benefit. And there's a great difference between the candidates on that issue. Between Senator McCain, so the difference between Senator McCain and Senator Obama, Senator McCain doesn't promote embryo destructive. I said it's worth looking at their websites and considering the difference between the candidates because the difference is startling and chilling. Next question. Um, now, I, I, I say this with some humility. Dave is one of my best students, and I, I confess I'm not entirely sure what you just asked, Dave. Um, <laughs> But I'll stall for a second by, by entertaining the crowd with this anecdote. I'm also an adventurous voter. I started my presidential voting career as a mere tyke of 18 by voting for George McGovern. So think about that one. Uh, but I, I mean, I, I think judicial appointments are an important issue, uh, more important than you would, you would think from looking at the media. To put it's it being more, eclipsed by other issues. To put it in more succinct terms, I mean, right now, the. Right now, Justice Stevens is most likely the next justice to retire. If a conservative justice takes his place, we're looking at a greater probability of being able to overturn Roe and Casey. Mm -hmm. If not, if President Obama were to appoint the next justice or the next two or three justices, we're looking at enshrining Roe and Casey for the next 40 years, at least. How I think that's that probably true, and I, and I think that's something that ought to be thrown in your shopping cart to consider. And how, how does that affect your rationale? Well, I think um, a lot has been, you know, uh, there's a lot of emphasis put on what justices who will be appointed to the Supreme Court in the future will do. Um, in the past, those kinds of hopes have often failed. Um, it's very difficult to know for sure what will happen when a judge is appointed to the bench. Um, I'm not saying that that should mean that you should discount what you described, but I do think that um, something else to think about is if more pro-life voters were involved heavily in both parties um, and affecting choices that those parties made in, in their policies, some of what you're concerned about might, might change. One final question, and the first question from a non-student to Professor Conley. No pressure. Ah. Oh, thank you. I'm, I'm Professor Conley from the Mathematics Department. My question is, is to uh, Professor Bradley. Um, the basis of your argument uh, is that uh, embryos are persons, and killing persons is immoral. I want to offer a thought experiment. Uh, consider an ovum just moments after being fertilized by a sperm. You have defined this to be a person, possessed of the same moral dignity as an infant one month after birth, say. 
uh, why doesn't it follow that this same living human o ovum and living human sperm one minute before conception when considered together also possess the same moral worth or similar moral worth? What is present one minute after, which is absent one minute before? In short, um, why have you not, in effect, offered a proof that every sperm is sacred? Well, I didn't. It's worse than that. Uh, I didn't even offer a proof that people begin at conception. Um, this isn't the occasion to do that. Um, I'll have to be invited back and I didn't say that. More I, money. Said, I said that uh, those are persons. No, I, my position is that people begin at conception, and although it, it it may not be helpful to suggest they have the same dignity as everybody else. I certainly do assert they have the same right not to be killed as everybody else does. You and me, Professor Sneed, Professor Solomon. And um, the difference is that before conception, there isn't a human being, and after conception, there is. The sperm and the egg are parts, discrete parts, of two other people, the mother and the father. I, I asked, what was present after that was not present before? Well, after conception, the two have become, the two have joined to form a unique, living, developing human individual, and that's just not true until sperm and egg unite. And that's the best I can do to answer your question. We have many people to thank. Let's thank, first of all, our host, the Center for Ethics and Culture. Let's thank you. Let's thank the students who volunteered to give the opening questions. You may applaud for yourself for listening so carefully and thinking through it through such hard work. And most of all, let's thank Professors Bradley and Rougeau for a stimulating evening.